Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am Young Seok Lim, the program director of the Apostle webinar in this year. Uh, Apostle is holding webinar in liver disease on every third Friday in each month in this year. It is my great pleasure to open this month's webinar uh, with the topic of updates of systemic therapy for hepatocellular carcinoma, which is very timely because many new novel therapeutic agents are being approved for HCC in these days. I am very much honored to introduce two chairpersons for this webinar, Professor Masao Omata and Professor Thomas Yao. Professor Masao Omata is the president of Yamanashi Center and the Kita Hospitals and also Professor Emeritus of the University of Tokyo. Professor Masa Omata has made an effort to revitalize the Apostle Asian Pacific Association for the Study of the Liver with uh, Dr. Shiv Sarin and others for the last 10 years. He is a co-editor-in-chief of the Hepatology International, an official journal of Apostle. He graduated from Chiba University School of Medicine under the supervision of Dr. Okuda and continued his training at Yale University and in the liver unit at University of Southern California. In 1992, he became chairman of the second department of international medicine at University of Tokyo, Japan, and then subsequently became chairman of the department of gastroenterology. Under his leadership, the Department of Gastroenterology had became one of the foremost centers in its field. Now he is the president of the two hospitals at Yamanashi, west of Tokyo, where although science plays with Mount Fuji, hepatitis virus infection is endemic and his homeland. He and his colleagues have published more than 1,200 articles in the journals, including New England Journal, Lancet, Annals of Internal Medicine, Gastroenterology, and Hepatology. A co-chairperson, Dr. Thomas Yao, is Clinical Associate Professor in Medical Oncology of the University of Hong Kong. Dr. Yao graduated from the University of Hong Kong and started his medical oncology training initially at Queen Mary Hospital, Hong Kong, and then he was later trained as a clinical research fellow at Royal Marston Hospital, London. His main research interests are gastrointestinal oncology, early phase clinical trials, and the translational research. He pioneered Hong Kong liver cancer classification, which has revolutionized the treatment algorithm of liver cancer patients. Moreover, he is actively involved in cancer drug uh, development, especially in the field of cancer immunology. He has led several global groundbreaking immunotherapy trials for liver cancer, and some of these trials led to global drug approval for advanced hepatocellular carcinoma patients. He has published more than 140 peer review publications in various leading oncology journals, namely Lancet, JAMA Oncology, Gastroenterology, Journal of Hepatology, and Clinical Cancer Research. Professor Mas Masa Omata and uh, Thomas Yao, please. Hello, my colleagues in Asia, Korea. Today, there is a symposium on the updates of systemat systematic therapy for hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is is from my own office in, in Japan. Uh, the first I have to uh, introduce, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Wan Sen Kang. Uh, he is a graduate of Yonsei University, had a training at the Severance Hospital, Yonsei University, and then later on, KAIST, Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in Korea. Currently, he is in a an assistant professor of medicine at uh, Samsung Medical Center. He will present a case of hepatocellular carcinoma 
progressing from intermediate stage to advanced stage. Dr. Kang, please. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to present a case of hepatocellular carcinoma progressing from intermediate stage to advanced stage. I have nothing to disclose. A 74-year-old gentleman was presented with uh, spadule varices and several hypoechoic liver nodules on ultrasonography from his general medical examination. He had been on oral medication for diabetes, dyslipidemia, and asthma, and also proton pump inhibitor for reflux aphagitis. His initial laboratory findings were as follows. Uh, he was negative for hepatitis B and C, and his liver stiffness measurement was 16.8 kilopascals, and his liver function was uh, child pure A5. So initially, he was evaluated for uh, the liver nodules by using liver dynamic CT. And on liver CT, uh, there was a two centimeter sized uh, nodule with arterial enhancement and delayed washout, which was consistent with the radiological findings of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, there were also several sub centimeter sized arterial enhancing nodules uh, around the uh, main tumor, uh, which is depicted as the white arrows. So clinically, he was diagnosed as hepatocellular carcinoma, and he was further uh, worked up with, for the stage workup. And on chest CT and bone scan, there was no evidence of extrahepatic metastases. Uh, however, on liver dynamic MRI, uh, it revealed the presence of multiple hepatocellular carcinomas uh, scattered in both hepatic lobes. So the patient was diagnosed as an intermediate stage uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Since the patient had compensated liver function and favorable performance status, a transarterial chemoembolization was recommended. So this is the progress. Initially, he was uh, treated with transarterial chemoembolization. And as you can see from the initial angiography, you can see the main nodule here and also some of the scattered uh, enhancement of the viable tumors. Uh, Follow-up with the uh, CT scan revealed that there were still several viable tumors uh, after TACE. So he underwent another session uh, for a month later. And afterwards, uh, there were still viable tumors after the second, uh, right, second round of TACE. So the patient proceeded with the uh, third round and also fourth and also fifth round. So just within about uh, eight, within about eight months of period, uh, he underwent five rounds of TACE. However, there were still viable tumors and the number of tumors increased. And also uh, there was also a progression of the disease with uh, uh, abdominal lymph node metastases. And the tumor markers were also increasing. And also his liver function has decreased from child pure A5 to A6 and his performance status has worsened from uh, one to uh, from zero to one. So in this episode of Basel Hepatology webinar, I would like to raise some questions for the next speakers to discuss. The first one is, when would you consider systemic therapy for intermediate stage HCC? And in this patient, he had many rounds of TACE. So how would you define TACE failure or refractoriness? And the second question is, uh, what options do we have for systemic therapy in hepatocellular carcinoma? We already know that there are atezolizumab and bevacizumab, sorafenib, and also lenvatinib. And among these, which systemic therapy would you recommend for this patient? And would there be any precautions to be, uh, to be considered? Thank you very much for your attention. He is currently a professor of principal scientist at uh, National Cancer Center. 
and he is deeply involved in the uh, prevention treatment of the hepatitis carcinoma for years. Uh, he graduated Seoul National University and he published more than 200 papers cited more than 18,000 times. He, he is a director of NCC Korea Innovation Unit. Today, the topic uh, he will touch upon is the taste refractoriness and systemic therapy for intermediate SCC. Dr. Park, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, today I'll talk about TAC refractoriness and systemic therapy for intermediate HCC. Uh, this question uh, is raised by Professor Kang. Disclosure. Intermediate stage liver with multiple tumors have a biologically a high rate of recurrence. Standard treatment TSC is considered as a palliative local treatment modality. To improve survival, switching to another treatment at an appropriate time should be considered. Therefore, it is a unmet clinical issue to make a definition of TSC refractoriness or a failure or unsuitable and to decide when we should switch to subsequent treatment. In case of remaining recurrence or progression of HCC after TAC, repeating TAC versus combination TAC plus system agent or other local regional treatment versus switching to systemic treatment versus switching to another local regional treatment. In, in this study, uh, liver transplantation specimen uh, after TSC, uh, total accuracy is achieved uh, in only uh, 38%. And so TSC uh, is a palliative treatment modality. Past time, this is a Korean National Cancer Center data. All treatment array of HC from initial treatment to death, initial treatment to TSC, after then, from one to 19 sessions uh, of TSC. Uh, median number was three and median survival was 22.5. We have to consider staging system. Anatomical staging system starts with TNM stage from 1983 and clinical medical staging system starts 1985 uh, by Professor Okuda and Okuda staging. Why we need a staging system, prognosis, and guided to a selection of a therapy. Uh, past time uh, in Barcelona, uh, randomized controlled study to uh, unfortunately no treatment, so untreated non-surgical HCC patients showed a very poor prognosis. Median survival 17 months from one to 60 months. And Dr. Lovett analyzed something and the variables, uh, progression free uh, the performance status and constitutional syndrome, polar thrombosis and extra spread. And so there is a big difference uh, uh, here and there. So he suggests uh, early stage resection, amenable to resection. Uh, Unresectable HCC could be classified into two class, intermediate and advanced. And BCLC B stage, so-called uh, intermediate HCC was child pure A or B, performance state zero and multinodular, however, no worldwide consensus. Intermediate stage general meaning was the stage between curative treatment stage and systemic chemotherapy stage, or TC applicable stage or modified URC stage three, we don't know yet. Anyway, 205 ACL guideline, BCLC staging system and treatment strategy suggests intermediate stage 
uh, was a multinodular performance stage zero, child A and B. And uh, the best treatment of this stage, intermediate stage, is chemoembolization. However, this intermediate stage includes a wide range of patients, and so heterogeneous patient population in the aspect of tumor burden and liver function. So, Italian Bolondi suggests the substaging system. Intermediate substage B1, B2, B3, B4, and uh, child according to child score and tumor burden, he used uh, up to seven criteria defined as HC with seven as the sum of the diameter of the largest tumor and the number of a tumor. And the best condition is a child score 567 and uh, in the up to seven criteria. In the case, first option is TAC, alternative option is LT or TAC plus ablation and median survival time was 41 months. Very nice. This staging system uh, was modified by Professor Kudo and uh, he suggests the kinky modification and uh, uh, five, uh, five, six, seven and uh, uh, the within up to seven criteria, curative treatment, he suggests the resection ovulation and super selective TAC, alternative DAP TAC. Uh, recent uh, uh, the European guidelines suggest uh, preserved function for intermediate stage. Preserved liver function means child only child A. Very the, the limited. Uh, Korean guideline, we use modified UIC stage. And so uh, one of stage two and one of stage three. Uh, two, two class uh, is uh, similar to the intermediate stage. In the case, uh, multiple tumor and uh, no vascular invasion. In the case, the best option is a TAC or LT RF ablation, uh, TAC or LT RF ablation. However, uh, there are many imaging diagnosis imaging systems. And uh, nowadays, uh, many researchers use LIRAS. Uh, however, treatment practice influenced the design of HC imaging system. In Western, uh, Western system, uh, weight, high specificity. Eastern system, weight, uh, high sensitivity. How about molecular classification? Uh, molecular classification by HCC, uh, they don't mention about the uh, intermediate stage or a staging system. And so there is a big gap and cracks uh, between the imaging study liver function and performance. In European guideline, uh, TAC is very important treatment uh, with evidence and recommendation. The evidence is two randomized controlled trials in Barcelona and in Hong Kong. However, you, we have to think about this uh, randomized control trials, TC versus no treatment. And three year overall survival was uh, uh, around 28%. And after then, many guidelines recommend TSC in inter so-called intermediate stage, multinodular unresectable, trial A, performance uh, zero, Japan, one to three tumors over three centimeter or four tumors, trial A or B, vas uh, no vascular image, I'm sorry. And Korean guideline, it's patient with good performance status without major vascular invasion or extra spared, ineligible for surgery, LT, RF ablation, PET. In case with uh, porave invasion, localized tumors, and well preserved liver function, uh, we, can re we can recommend the combination with uh, radiation therapy. However, we think about the randomized controlled trials uh, in all the patient characteristics child B, 30% and 11%, and tumor size maximum to 14 centimeters, and polar invasion. 
very wide range of patients were enrolled in the randomized controlled trial and the, the, that uh, result was uh, applied to many uh, guidelines. So TEC was the most frequently used uh, uh, first record age treatment in B-cells stage B and C in practice worldwide, like this. And the Korean guideline uh, applied TEC here, 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 and here, here, here. European guideline TEC size 5 to centimeter, tumor node assessed with superselective catheterization. However, they suggest alternative treatment. And interestingly, they use the terminology TEC failure refractoriness to not suitable for local therapy. Very interesting, uh, last year. And over survival uh, TEC, uh, from oriental study, uh, 27 in Japan Oriental Study 28, uh, Dr. Ogasawa's data 28, and so uh, around 27 to 28 is the overall survival of the conventional TSC. Switching from TSC to systemic treatment, who and when? This opposite guideline suggests uh, uh, switching from TSC to systemic treatment, but uh, the, 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 there is no definitive, definitive uh, uh, indication. Uh, there are uh, several indications for score, uh, indications for switching. Score system to predict TC response. Uh, China, uh, China suggests tumor size and number. Uh, uh, Taipei suggests uh, RB liver function and alpha fetoprotein and tumor burden. And Austrian, Austrian group suggests uh, liver function, tumor burden, and inflammation. And another Austrian uh, group suggests the RT score, change of uh, uh, the hepatocyte of injury and the tumor burden, and uh, child score change. And Korean group suggests the tumor size, uh, alpha fetoprotein, child uh, score, and TAC response. And French group uh, suggests alpha fetoprotein, B cell stage, child score changing, and tumor response. And uh, Italian group suggests tumor number, albumin, bilirubin, alpha fetoprotein, and tumor size. Very complicated. However, recent technical advance with the uh, CM con BMCT and microcatheter uh, use, uh, this advance have been have both goals, local control and liver function preservation. Look at this, one, two, three, four small, very difficult tumors can be applied by TEC and perfectly uh, treated by uh, Professor Chung in Seoul National University. A very nice uh, slide. So recently, the TEC, the outcome improved uh, almost double times. TSC failure. What is the TSC failure and refractoriness? I think the failure is up from the beginning is an indication issue and refractoriness is a failure after success and so subsequent therapy issue. However, what is the failure? In imaging, when? Research criteria or modify? Or out what outcome? Local progression free survival or progression free survival or over survival? I don't know. So we need precondition, stage, tumor number, size, vascular invasion, liver function, echo type of a tumor, vascularity, and tumor response, local control or remaining, or uh, session number and interval, and time to recurrence progression uh, should be included the definition. TSC failure or not suitable the definition was the uh, first time uh, suggested by Professor Kudo and uh, Dr. Rao in 2011 with the consensus report. And after then 2012, the Japanese group and uh, our institution 
uh, reported uh, retrospective study and suggest uh, refractoriness. And the uh, consensus meeting, I and my colleagues suggest refractoriness, and the Austrian group suggests uh, not suitable for the first TSC, art score and state. Recently, this uh, definition was more improved, and so Professor Kudo suggests uh, TSC failure or refractoriness, such as intrahepatic lesion uh, after change. Uh, the, the incomplete necrosis, uh, even after changing the agent to a feeding artery, to a more consecutive progression, even after changing the agent to feeding artery, at one to three months after selective TSC, vascular invasion, uh, extra pass spread, uh, continuous elevation tumor mark. Korean guidelines suggest refractoriness after on demand two or more sessions of TSC within six months of foster TSC, developed one or more absence of objective res response or uh, st stage migration. Recently, uh, Professor Kudo suggests unsuitable condition is easily refractory to TSC beyond up to seven, condition in which TSC causes a deterioration of liver function, condition that are not to respond to TSC, tumor type. This is my case, a 60 year old man. Uh, yeah, and uh, five centimeter, three tumors, and I, I treated him with TSC after two months, weaker proton beam therapy after two months, second TSC, and uh, after five months, uh, uh, marginal recurrence RF ablation, after seven months, uh, third TSC, after four months, uh, fourth TSC, after eight months, uh, I applied the second proton beam therapy, after 15 months, uh, new recurrence of uh, fifth TAC after five months is multiple recurrence and six months uh, and after three months multiple recurrence after six months and so I, I did a biopsy. This is a case. There are the, some remaining tumor and TAC and marginal recurrence, TAC and marginal recurrence and a new tumor and TAC and marginal recurrence. There is no recurrence no recurrence, no recurrence, but the new recurrence and new recurrence. Yes. So how could the TSC refractive patient be treated? First, switch to combination TSC with the system agent or local regional treatment. By now, six randomized control trial of TAC plus uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor versus TAC for intermediate stage HCC all failed. But uh, Professor Kudo's tactics trial uh, shows the success. Uh, he used unsuitable uh, on T on unsuitable TAC is the uh, progression he de he defined progression, and so he got a success. Nowadays, MRD1 study is ongoing. TAC plus double uh, every four weeks, and after then double plus bevacizumab. This study is ongoing. This study is very interesting uh, from Azan Medical Center, and uh, uh, Professor Im is a uh, designed this study. And uh, advanced stage HCC, sorapenib versus uh, TAC plus uh, radiation therapy. Sorapenib plus, uh, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, TAC plus radiation therapy shows the better uh, overall survival and progression free survival. And so uh, why not for intermediate stage TAC refractory patient? I think, I think it is very, uh, very hopeful treatment modality for ref TC refractoriness. And switch to systemic treatment. Uh, Professor Ogasawa uh, reported that conversion to sorafenib improves survival competed with the continuing TSC. However, two studies uh, were uncontrolled retrospective studies. So we are waiting for uh, controlled prospective studies result. 
sorafenib, very good result. Sorafenib, very good result comparing to continuing TAC. And switch to another local regional treatment. Recently, I, uh, I and my colleagues, our center reported that the proton beam radiotherapy boosts the radio frequency ovulation for recurrent hepatic cellular carcinoma, randomized three, three trials. Uh, the result, uh, this, uh, uh, this first phase three trial with uh, proton beam therapy effect on local progression free survival with the statistical confirmation of non inferiority versus RF ovulation in patients with recurrent or raised to HC within one to two tumors with a size less than three centimeter. And in PBT arm, TC site recurrence case, cases was 46.3%. So we can use uh, proton beam therapy. Another interesting case, another interesting study was performed. Uh, phase three study with the inner pore of HC single nodule, no more five centimeter, one to three nodules, no more three centimeter in diameter after incomplete TAC, uh, randomized to SBRT in three to six fraction uh, or to new TAC. And uh, SBRT shows uh, good result, local control and the survival, progression free survival. And from the beginning, give up TC and start combination treatment or systemic treatment. Nowadays, Lamba team shows a very long progression free survival and the Atejo Beba uh, treatment shows a very long progression free survival and uh, Atebeba shows a long overall survival. And and uh, randomized control studies, uh, BCLC B stage patients are in, uh, included in the, the study patient and the, the blue, blue bar means uh, BCLC B stage HCC. And some portion of all successful randomized control trials uh, includes uh, BCLC B stage. And Professor Kudo, he suggests TC unstable HCC, and he reported lambatinib as an initial treatment in patient with the intermediate stage hepatic cell carcinoma beyond up to seven uh, criteria and child pure A liver function, uh, progression free survival, lambatinib 16 months uh, comparing to TAC three months, uh, over survival and 37.9 months uh, comparing to TAC 21.3 months. I'm very hopeful. However, this uh, study is uncontrolled retrospective study, but propensity score matches study. Uh, we are waiting for the prospective controlled study data result. And finally, phase three, randomized controlled trial of Artesio Beba versus TSC in intermediate stage HC with high burden. High burden. Uh, this study, ABC study, uh, is starting. And uh, the inclusion criteria, uh, multifocal HC beyond the Milan criteria, more than one over one centimeter, no diffuse infiltrate time, no massive time, no proper invasion, no spread. And so, uh, we are waiting for the final result. My case, I started sorafenib and uh, over one year, uh, partial remission, but uh, my patient uh, complained chronic diarrhea. There is no tumor progression. Summary. Unresectable HCC has been divided into intermediate and advanced stage. The definition of intermediate stage is still extensive. For patients with unresectable HCC, the TC method has been developed and proven effective compared to uh, no treatment at a time when no proven systemic treatment was available. For improving survival, intermediate stage HCC should be divided into those who can benefit from, from TAC treatment and those who do not respond to TAC treatment. Although there is no multidisciplinary global consensus on TAC refractory failure unsuitable, uh, especially interventional radi radiologists, they don't agree with uh, uh, this de definition. However, there are weak common denominators for who 
randomized control trial of a systemic treatment or a combination treatment have begun or being prepared. Effective novel system treatment, which show a high rate of tumor response and long-term survival may surpass the benefit of TSC. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Professor Park. So may I just introduce the first speaker, Professor Annie Chen. Uh, Professor Chen is uh, actually a well-known figure in, um, in the realm for the management of hepatocellular carcinoma. Annie is a distinguished professor. I'm also director of the NTU Cancer Center of National Taiwan University. He received his uh, MD degree and also a PhD degree and subsequently uh, received internal medicine and medical oncology training in the medical school of the National Taiwan University. And then he, in 1990, he was a research fellow uh, in the University of Wisconsin. Professor Chen has been actively involved in uh, the basic translational and um, clinical research in hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, he has been published more than 300 uh, peer review articles. Um, he was elected as a fellow of uh, American Association um, for the Advancement of Science. Um, he, he received multiple awards for his outstanding research. Um, he was elected as a national um, chair professor in uh, 2013 and has been the founding director of the um, NTU Cancer Center. So, Professor Chen, please. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas. Okay, so can you see my slide now? So, can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Thank you. So today I would like to share with you some of the, uh, the point about the evolution of systemic therapy, particularly after the invention of artisoban. As we know, artisoban uh, was reported in the end of 2019. So uh, after that, we have already been very familiar with this treatment. So um, in the past one, is one year and six months, now we have a point to, to have a perspective what the new treatment would have impact of the future uh, treatment guideline. So this is a concept uh, figure to show you how the evolution system therapy in the past. So we started in 2017. And can you just hit? Can you control my slides? Thank you. So in the past 10 years, we have seen the evolution. Uh, sorry, back. So I have misunderstood your purpose. So I have already uploaded everything. So I think I don't have to control it. So right now this is... Uh, in the year 2020, we have this new regiment. Next, please. So after that, there are several things that we are going to uh, fix. The first is the change of therapeutic guideline. So we have two school of thought about the therapeutic guideline. So as we can just uh, saw the guideline from Japan and Korea, and they belong to another school. And this is a guideline for the uh, most of the Western country, from ASCO, ESMO. They try to divide the first line into one with preference, and the other is just uh, contraindicated or not preferred by the artisanal treatment. So there's a preference for the first line treatment. Next, please. So these are the most of the guidelines in the world. Uh, the systemic treatment are not specified. So you can use either DKI, that is so nothing and embodied. Or you can use a piece of that. And we can understand after systemic treatment only so nothing, we have third validated second line. And after a piece of that or the embodied, 
we don't have any evidence base uh, to support our practice. Next, please. Next, please. So in the future, in the past we have Sonafi been there for more than 10 years. That means we have a lot of time to develop second lock with placebo control. But after the martini and the emergence of Tizomene is only about two years time. So Although these are going to be a little bit prevalent at this point. Next, please. The majority of patients will probably fail the first night of the embarking or a piece of that. Next, please. So there are the dilemma of second night treatment for HCC, particularly after a piece of that. So there are practical problems of definitive second night trials. First, the placebo control are no longer acceptable. So I just explained all the second line PKI, but the cinema use placebo as control. So the, the bar for positivity is lower. And second, there are no motivation to compare multiple candidates. So at this point, after you fail a piece of them, at least seven possible treatments are there. So it's almost impossible for us to compare seven at the same time, even with some more to come. Next, please. And worse to that, after artisanal prevail in the first line, the second line after a checkpoint inhibitor and the anti yet will be very, very difficult because we have used up two of the most important gradients of the treatment for liver cancer. Next. Fortunately, we still have some effort. For example, the even phase two five one, the second line atizobab plus PKI versus PKI after atizobab. That means when people fail atizobab, we can try to hit with atizobab plus a TKI, that's a bad bar and sulfate. That means we don't use those already in the second line TKI. Either we use the Martini or Sonavi alone. So this kind of study can tell us whether after a piece of that, we should use TKI alone or TKI plus a checkpoint inhibitor. But still, there are much more to compare. For example, we don't know what happened to carboxanthine. What will happen? to regolaphony, uh, even to a uh, double a checkpoint inhibitor, for example, epilibuma plus imodoma. So these are the questions that are really facing us in the future. Next, please. Next. Next. So probably for a period of time, at least for two years, we can use some post real world data that's a that's a, a, a problem. Next, please. Next. So this probably is a well done a real data analysis from Korea. And after Atizobab, TKI overall had a response there around uh, six person, and the median overall survival around fourteen point seven biases in selected patient. Next, please. And next thing I would like to mention is that uh, after Atizobab success, there is now a new era of combination therapy uh, ahead. Next, please. Next. Primarily, we have a tablet, a checkpoint inhibitor tablet, or TKI plus ICI tablet. Next, please. And these are what we probably will have in the next two or three years. Next. Next, please. We start with artiso bed, but later we are going to see what happens artiso carbo. And this study is very important. It will tell us whether 
a piece of carbon, that means the only difference is TKI compared with anti -vision. Whether TKI can do better than a selective region, probably this study will share us with some of the information. Next. A similar combo. Next, please. It's a partly plus pembrolizuma. Next. And a pembrolizuma plus bembatinib. Next. And the double about anti CTRA4 and anti CT1 is a double. The bottom one plus trevanimuma. Next, please. And a nimobra plus epidimuma. And these are all the combos. So after a piece of that, we are going to see two different kinds of major combos. And we are going to see if any one of them can be better. Next, please. And whether triplet will be a next, next step. And this is some of the information that is reported by Thomas. And uh, it's a cohort six of Checkmate 40. And this is an interesting a small study compared double from triple A. So this is a NIBO plus carbon density. And this is Nimoma AP plus carbon. So this is a, a typical double A compared triple A. We hope that we can have a better efficacy by a triple Next, please. Next. Next. And this is a, a, a result of that very, very small study. Next, please. And we see somehow to a concept that the triple is doing better than the double in terms of response rate. Next and the survivors. Next, please. Next, please. Previous slide, please. Um, I, lastly, I'd like to uh, elaborate something about the post artisanal bank. After a failure of a systemic therapy, typically we are thinking about the next drug, so that's second line treatment. Previous slide, please. So I would like to mention whether there is a rule for local regional therapy in this scenario. Next. Next. Next, please. And this is the update response and delay response of in 150. When we review this data, we will realize we are going to see a high tumor response rate and a durable response is a median duration of response up to 18 months. Next, please. So that means durable response will be more than 10 percent, with a cover of six months of tumor remission. Next, please. So there's probably a special form of PD after artisanal. That is, isolated is scan after prolonged remission. Next, please. And this is the case that we treated, and the patient was treated by artisanal for its uh, advanced liver cancer. Next, please. Next. Next, please. After 24 weeks, you see the tumors rank in multiple sites. Next. And at 40 weeks, with other lesions remain in control. But next, please. There's the isolated escape here. A part of this remaining tumor grew rapidly to become an isolated escape. So at this point, some may choose to use TKI, but the doctor in charge decided to do a resection. Next, please. So resection was done. And then a piece of bed was stopped at cycle 15. Next. And after two more years, the patient remained disease free. Next, please. Is this just an exceptional case, or there are some biologic uh, reason behind this kind of scenario? So we are trying to hypothesize some of the biologic difference between respondents. 
is the immunotherapy and conventional therapy. Next, please. And this is a basic about the, uh, the biologic difference between immunotherapy and conventional therapy. You will give chemotherapy or targeted therapy. Typically, the response won't be short, won't be too long. And next. And the cell undergoes apoptosis. By definition, a apoptosis cell induces more inflammation. You will give with immunotherapy. Next, please. It's a typical immune elimination. That means we have to have the cytotoxic T cell accumulated to kill the tumor. Next, please. And this is a good example of, of uh, uh, from metastatic melanoma. And as we know, melanoma typically have very good targeted therapy and also have very good immunotherapy to treat. And this is a, a very strong double targeted therapy for melanoma. And this is a very strong double checkpoint inhibitor of melanoma. And after neoadjuvant therapy, that means started drug first, resect the tumor later. And these are two of them representing each arm of the complete pathology responder. Next, please. So in the case of MTT, there's no inflammation. These are typically high ionization with some only macrophages taking up the melanin. Next. And this is after the checkpoint inhibitor. A lot of the immune T cell surrounding uh, in the residual area. So that means a lot of immune cells will accumulate. With the past time, they would fade away. But anyway, some of them appear to change their biologic characteristic. Next, please. So this is a, a hypothesis that uh, immunoadditive start with uh, immune elimination. Next, please. So the tumor start from immune elimination in the body at a certain point which equivalent and then escape from our immune surveillance. And the tumor grow to a certain degree. That's our clinical tumor. Now we do all the treatment on this kind of stage. Next, please. Next. So after we give immunotherapy, typically a checkpoint inhibitor, then there's a reverse immunotherapy. A immune escape tumor may reverse to immune equivalent. And then if there's a complete responder, it's immune elimination. Next, please. And we believe there are some patients with prolonged immune equivalent status. Next. 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 And these patients, some of them will become a thorough responder. Next, please. And this problem is very similar to what we observe in the liver oligometastasis from colorectal cancer. So for the liver oligometastasis from colorectal cancer, we can divide it into three uh, type, immune type, canonical, and soma. There are 28 percent immune type. And for the immune type, next please, it's typical of immune phenotype by molecular signature. Next. And they are characterized by rare widespread recurrence. Next. And a good survival. Next. So we may say if there are three kinds of oligomets in liver by prochlorotic cancer, there's one good oligometastasis. They are immune phenotype. Next. So the good oligomets are characterized by immune contextual expression. And we believe there are some white mat up checkpoint inhibitors that become good oligomats. So they may enjoy a local regional therapy, and some of them may even be cured. Next, please. So we suggest that understanding tumor biology of the fetal responder may help select those patients 
who are most likely to benefit from restriction or other low provisional setup. Next. So in summary, instead of trying to uh, repeat all the data of artisomet, I try to say something in perspective. The artisomet has already changed something, and it's going to change other things. First of all, they have already changed our security guidelines, particularly in Western country. It's your preference for artisomet as first line treatment. And after artisomet, we must admit we have scarce options for second line. And the artisanal bed success really opened a new era of combination system therapy. And we have a total of seven big study that will share us their final results in the next two to three years. And finally, I would like to say after artisanal bed, at this, at this point, some of them probably a very selective group of patients, some of them, the biology of tumor changed. And they probably deserve a local regional therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Chen, for a very enlightening uh, lecture. Also, let me introduce the next uh, speaker, um, Professor Kudo. So Professor Kudo actually graduated uh, from the uh, Kyoto University. Um, afterwards, he has uh, training in the uh, um, Kobe City General Hospital. Uh, subsequently, he has overseas training at the University of California Davis Medical Center in USA. Currently, Professor Kudo is a chairman and professor at the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in the Kinder University Faculty of Medicine for more than 20 years. Um, um, he's currently executive board member of the Kinder University. Academically, Professor Kudo has published more than 1,000 international scientific peer review paper in the well-regarded journal. Um, his uh, uh, index is uh, 186. In addition to that, he also has published um, around 1,000 um, domestic scientific paper. Um, he has given um, around 500 invited lecture you know, all over the world. Um, uh, majority of them, they are related to liver cancer. He, was, he served as an executive board committee and also chairman of a lot of um, different related society. Uh, to name a few, he was the past president of the Asian Pacific Primary Liver Cancer Association from uh, 2015 to 2017. Um, also, he was the past president of the AFSUMB, um, executive uh, uh, board member of the uh, Japanese Society of Hepatology. He's um, Professor Kudo is the first author of the consensus uh, based practice guideline of HCC proposed by the Japanese Society of Hepatology. So, Professor Kudo, please. Thank you very much, Thomas, and uh, for your kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. I'd like to share my slide. Um, my, uh, my role is to talk about the uh, role of TKI. TKI still have roles for advanced ACC in era of uh, combination immunotherapy. So as Professor uh, Andy Chen talked, the Atezabel with uh, now a standard care and uh, very good survival benefit over uh, uh, solar penny. So now uh, most of the guidelines uh, accept, uh, accept the Atezabel for the first line systemic therapy worldwide. However, some of the ACC are resistant to ICI. Early PD or when beta catenin mutated ACC or 
Nash rated HCC. So ICR is uh, not perfect because some, uh, even atezolumab had the uh, early PD, 19%, uh, best response is 19%, but 19% is uh, better than uh, 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 ICR monotherapy, such as nivolumab or pembrolizumab, 37%, 32%. And also, atezolumab uh, to the six months, uh, P, uh, uh, PFS rate is 55%, which means PD rate at six months is 45%. So we need uh, next line of treatment. So in uh, at, at the... Of Atezolumab is an antibody plus antibody. So maybe <clears throat> the liver function can be preserved. So more than, maybe I presume more than 80% of patients can be candidates for second line therapy. So I, uh, we, our group uh, tested the second line agent for after atezolumab failure and not atezolumab. Uh, this is a, uh, monotherapy, uh, ICI monotherapy between uh, our, at our university, the clinical trials of uh, uh, ICI monotherapy, IO monotherapy, right after lambatinib. Uh, we checked the efficacy of uh, IOs uh, followed by lambatinib because uh, there is a data uh, that after termination of ICA, binding of PD-1 and lymphocyte lasts more than 20 weeks. This is a, uh, this publication in Nivolumab in non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, after ta termination of uh, Nivolumab, the complete binding rate is still to, uh, uh, 25%. It's a, it, the, this binding is uh, effective and uh, lasts more than 20 weeks. That means the, the, PD, the PD-1 antibodies effect lasts more than 20 weeks, but uh, maybe uh, tumor micro, uh, immune micro, uh, tumor micro environment is become suppressive. So PD-1 antibodies, nivolumab's efficacy was, uh, became uh, not, not good. So we introduced Rembatinib right after I, IO. So at, in our study, objective response rate is much, uh, much higher than maybe also median PFS and the median OS from start of Rembatinib or median OS from the first line IO 30 months. And the, most of them are second line or third to fourth line. And waterfall plot is good. And also spider plots show a durable long lasting by uh, lambatinib right after IO. And uh, this is not a good way to compare because this is a, a retrospective, very small numbers of patients. But uh, this is a two second and fourth line. However, just for reference, the objective response rate or median PFS or median OS and also median OS from first line IO is uh, longer than first line lambatinib or first line nivolumab. The, that means uh, IO followed by uh, lambatinib show a very good response and uh, provides a durable response and a good uh, overall survival. As you know, PD-1 uh, L1 expression is a sign, uh, I mean, um, induced by immune response. So <clears throat> immune response induced the immune escape, as you know. So uh, when after a CTL attacks the cancer cell by buffering granzyme, interferon gamma induces the PDL1, and the tumor uh, immune escape uh, happens. So that means P expression of PDL1 expression is a sign of the presence of CTL around the tumor microenvironment. So in order to uh, 
In order to achieve the response by IC uh, checkpoint inhibitor, uh, mutation burden should be high, maybe even should be inogenic. Then CD8 T cell can inv in invade to the tumor and then attack the tumor cell, then PDL1 express. So these three uh, factors are very important. The, the very good example is uh, MSI high tumors. So immunogenesis uh, is high, so CD8 positive cell uh, in, uh, infiltrate into the tumor, then attack the cancer, then PDL1 is expressed. So uh, PD1 monotherapy is uh, very effective, but not for MSI low because CD8 positive cell is not infiltrated in the tumor. But more importantly, tumor, in, uh, tumor immune microenvironment is very important. I'll show you the, some uh, suggestive case. This uh, 58 year old male uh, with a bone metastasis. He received a uh, laparoscopic resection, just sized, measured two centimeter in diameter. But two years later, uh, this patient complained of uh, buttocks pain, abdominal pain, dysuria, and this defecation. MRI CT reviewed the bone, uh, bone mass, but uh, not in uh, liver intrahepatic metastasis. So we uh, performed uh, biopsy, bone biopsy, then confirmed as a metastasis case CC. So we performed radiation for the PET positive tumor. And uh, because of the, this radiation, the tumor shrinkage was obtained. And uh, after that, we introduced rembatinib, but uh, gradually, AFP is gradually increased. Then uh, uh, in the, the biopsy sample, MSI was high, so we introduced pembrolizumab, but uh, it was not effective. AFP is increased. The tumor be became large, so we, changed and we challenged Rembatinib because uh, of, uh, I'll show you the reason. The AFP drops and uh, drops uh, dramatically, then FDG uh, accumulation is decreased and the tumor was became shri uh, uh, shrinked. So this is a uh, uh, immunostaining, immunochemical staining, CD4, CD8, PDL1 is positive. So pembrolism, pembro should be effective, but uh, not effective because Fox P3 was positive, diffusely positive, T leg uh, is positive. So this was uh, uh, immune suppressive microenvironment, but uh, 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 the challenge, lambatinib worked very well to change the microenvironment to from immunosuppressive to immunoresponsive. So. According to immune-based classification, this exhausted immune class, in other words, uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment, this is uh, potentially effective. And uh, of course, ICI uh, plus anti is uh, effective, but also ICI lambatinib sequential therapy is also effective. And this is uh, not, this is true, uh, also true in, the all uh, targeted agent. The, this is AFP and uh, uh, this is uh, nivolumab. This is ICI, but uh, AFP or uh, PD af and after that, no, no, this is sorapenib. This is uh, ICI, still PD and uh, AFP is increased. But after that, after PD or bio, the regorapenib uh, sh showed the decrease of AFP and the PR was achieved. So also regulafenib has uh, uh, immunomodulation effect efficacy, ICI-TKI sequential therapy is effective. Also other TKIs, lembatinib, regulafenib, carbazantin, and also uh, ramsilumab has a uh, immunomodulation effect. So after failure of ICI checkpoint inhibitor, the the, these TKI and including uh, ramucilumab. 
one, and also sorafen, low dose sorafen is uh, effective for improving the micro, uh, micro environment. Also, beta catenin mutated ACC. The and other type, other cancer type, the the beta catenin mutation is uh, 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 immune cold tumor. The major driver mutation is CC is. Uh, A TART and the P53 beta catenin mutation. And the beta catenin mutation is a uh, beta catenin mutation is an activating mutation. So uh, catenin protein is increased, then the non T cell inframe is uh, increased. In other words, beta catenin and the T cell infiltration is inversely correlated in uh, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, ovarian cancer and ACC. So if there is no beta catenin mutation, ATF3 induced cis, uh, chemokine ligand 5 and the, the endotelic cell and the CD8 T cell is, uh, in, is in, in, induced. So T cell inherent tumor in, checkpoint inhibitor is very effective, but uh, in case of catenin mutation, the up, uh, increase of beta catenin protein reduce the CC, do not induce the CCL5. So very immune desert or immune cold tumor do not respond to the ICI because there is no uh, prayer CD8 positive cell. Actually, the James Harding uh, published uh, 2019 by uh, NGS, beta cutting mutated CC do not respond at all. PD rate is 100%, but uh, if there is no Catenin mutation, PD rate is 29%. And also uh, catenin mutated ACC show a shorter PFS than no catenin mutation. But in case of uh, targeted agents or the, uh, there is no, uh, there's no relationship with uh, beta catenin mutation. And uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, tested by uh, uh, immunohistochemistry, beta catenin activation also show the very uh, shorter PFS than no beta catenin activation. PDL1, CD8 positive, is a very good, uh, P show a very good better PFS. And also, beta catenin activation in terms of OS, the catenin activation is the poor, poorer efficacy. Two of ICI, two catenin mutated HCC compared to no, no activation. And also PDL1 or CD8 positivity is a better uh, survival. So, immune exclusion class, in other words, catenin mutations usually uh, primary resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitors because immune cells are excluded from the tumor by activated beta catenin protein. ICIs are not effective, like uh, this tumor, beta catenin protein is abundant. And that in that tumor, CD8 T cell is excluded. So ICIs are not effective. So how to identify beta catenin mutated ACC in clinical practice? In 2014, the already uh, EOB MRI, uh, 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 hepatobiliary phase of UVMRI can predict beta catenin mutation and resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy by uh, Professor Sakamoto's group from Keio University, 2014. The beta catenin mutation in induced OATP1B3, which is a um, <clears throat> imaging biomarker uh, of uh, EOBMRI. I, if I saw high intense in the hepatobiliary phase, there is, we can say beta catenin mutation is present. And also CCL5 is not induced. So tumor microenvironment is very uh, immune cold. And also pathologically, typical pathological morphology is uh, 
is observed but in with catenary mutation like uh, less BP or less IM or sealed glandular proliferation or bile production. In our study, the only very small case, only 18 case was uh, uh, compared uh, be before ICI therapy with patient with ISO hyperintense ACC nodule at the uh, uh, hepatobiliary phase of MRI, EOB MRI, showed the uh, PFS was observed according to RER, uh, relative enhanced re ratio. And also the, because 18 cases are too small, so we, in 18 cases, we uh, counted 68, we add 68 nodules, all of 68 nodules, ISO hyperintense ACC show a uh, uh, shorter time to nodular progression. Each nodule progress to more than 25% or more. So ISO high intensity of uh, hepatobiliary phase image of EOBMR could, uh, could be an imaging biomarker of beta catenary mutation and uh, resistance to ICI therapy. So a possible role of EOBMR in the treatment strategy if uh, uh, if there is an uptake of hepatobiliary phase of EOB MRI, 80% or 90% of the, these uh, patients are beta catenary mutation positive, so immune cold subclass. So maybe uh, checkpoint inhibitor is not effective, not so effective. But if there is no uptake, uh, monotherapy or uh, combined therapy will be effective. However, the Targeted agent uh, is not related with uh, uh, beta catenary mutation, so effect all of them are effective. Uh, among them, lenvatinib is effective for uh, effective, uh, uh, more effective as compared with other agent because from uh, Hiroshima University in Japan, uh, using TCGA data set, they showed the beta catenin expression correlates very well with high FGR4 expression. And also immunohistochemical staining FGR4 ISC positive patient show a very high response rate, 81% as compared with negative expression of FGR4, 31%. And also PFS 5.5 months as compared with 2.5 months. So the FGR4 high uh, ACC, in other words, most, more, most, more, uh, most of them are beta catenary mutation, mutated ACC is sensitive to lambatinib because, as you know, lambatinib has a high potency uh, of uh, inhibitory activity of uh, uh, FGR4, 100 times uh, stronger than sorafenib. So uh, FGF19R4 inhibition uh, signaling pathway is, can be blocked by I'll show you one case, the multiple lung uh, metastasis with uh, lymph node metastasis from, um, uh, at periarteal uh, aortic metastasis and also VP3 in the uh, right portal branch and also huge tumor. Was most of them uh, disappeared by uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitor clinical trial and the lung metastasis disappeared and the lymph node metastasis lymph node and the VP3 disappeared, but the small tumor shrinked, uh, but the, still there is a tumor. And uh, uh, this patient dropped out the uh, trial and the new region appeared. So we entered, and uh, also uh, EOB MRI show uh, slightly low intense. So we can uh, presume this patient has a beta catenary mutation. So we introduced Rambatinib. So quickly, the, this tumor became uh, uh, low dense and the necrotic and the shrinkage was obtained. So we, uh, and the com conversion surgery was performed and the all two, three tumor markers became uh, normal. And uh, this patient is cancer-free and drug-free more than six months. And uh, most of the uh, 
uh, tumors are necrotic, but the, they are a small viable region. This, this viable region, beta catenin protein, was abandoned, and the CD8 positive cell was excluded. So there is no response. But it, uh, as you know, that this is a very uh, heterogeneous tumor. In the same tumor, or in, inter-tumor inter, uh, heterogeneity, or intra uh, intra-tumor heterogeneity is uh, very uh, uh, st strong. So maybe the no beta catenin mutated HCC metastasized to the lung or uh, lymph node or vascular invasion. So it responds well to, to the ICI, but not beta catenin mutated uh, Crohn. So in this uh, subgroup of immune exclusion class, Lembatin is effective in beta catenin mutated HCC. So of course, that is aware well with the first line, if there is no uh, autoimmune disease, Lembatin should be the second line uh, agent because immunomodulation effect and also effective in beta catenin mutated HCC, also uh, effective in poorly differentiated HCC. How about NASH related HCC? NASH is a global problem, and also already the uh, Kanazawa University group already showed the immune response, immune response to 16 tumor antigen peptide. This is a 16 pep antigen peptide, and uh, this is a patient number. The viral hepatitis has a 67% uh, um, uh, or 76% immune response was observed by uh, interferon gamma production, but uh, in NASH HCC, only 33%. Maybe in NASH HCC, was, uh, less, the immune response is uh, 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 deteriorated. So each uh, immune uh, response to the uh, each uh, tumor antigen, the in, uh, only NASH, the response is uh, decreased. So this year, uh, in March, the new topics of NASH HCC, there is a two uh, si simultaneous publication. The one, first one is uh, NASH, uh, the mechanism of uh, liver damage in NASH and also Another paper from the same group from the Germany, the NASH uh, is not, may not be effective to the immunotherapy. So first paper clearly uh, show, shows the activated CD8 T cell in, is, is not the norm, usual one. The T cell, this CD8 T cell is activated by uh, not this T, uh, T cell is not activated by cancer antigen through MH, MHC class one. MHC, uh, independent activation mechanism is there. So this killing by autoaggressive CD8 T cell uh, fundamentally differed from by antigen specific cells, which mechanistically distinguishes autoaggressive and the uh, prospective cell immunity. And another uh, paper, uh, there is a lots of uh, experiment after, and uh, then says hepatic CD8, activated CD8 T cell increase during NASH progression and the CD8 positive T cell promote HCC in NASH and lack of response to immunotherapy in NASH HCC. This is a um, in in, uh, in intratumor, the, the anti-PD-1 antibody increased CD8 positive cell and also activated CD8 positive cell. And this anti-PD-1 antibody does not decrease the tumor size or tumor number. And instead, in the severe fibrosis is induced by anti-PD-1 antibody. And the ICI is, is uh, effective for non-NASH mouse model, as you can see here, the non-NASH HCC model, uh, mouse model, the PD-1 show uh, prolonged the overall survival. And uh, because in non-NASH model, anti-tumor surveillance is, uh, uh, is decreased because this 
activated CD8 T cell. CD8 T cell is activated, not the MHC1 class 1 antigen uh, specific, uh, anti not at antigen specific activation, but uh, resident like activation. So there is no uh, surveillance. So uh, can incidence of uh, cancer seems like a uh, uh, non-NASH model, CD8 T cell, uh, I'm sorry, uh, CD8 T cell is uh, uh, recognized uh, cancer antigen uh, presented by MSC class one. So uh, anti-tumor surveillance is effective. So cancer does not grow in uh, immune uh, immune elimination phase. However, in NASH, the anti-tumor surveillance is impaired. So immune uh, elimination phase, the tumor cannot e eliminate by uh, CD8 positive cell. And the PD-1 antibody in cancer, immune response to an tumor antigen is decreased. So cannot uh, attack the cancer cell. So this, uh, in NASH HCC, immune response to anti human antigen is decreased and the imp impaired anti human surveillance. So, one of the pathogenesis of NASH HCC is the dysregulation of immune surveillance. And uh, this is also very important, uh, most important in clinical data the validation cohort one and the validation cohort two from the different country. The pure NASH confirmed by bio biopsy, the uh, NAFL uh, by uh, ICI treatment, NAFL related HCC, the OS is shorter than non NAFL HCC in the independent two validation cohort. So, and also multivariable analysis of prognostic factor, uh, uh, multivariate analysis showed uh, NAFL is a uh, independent prognosis factor has a duration of 2.6. So survival benefit is poorer in NASH HCC. However, efficacy of lambatinib by etiology, the, uh, our, our group the collected the Nafrud NASH patient, 103 patient, as, and compared with the viral and alcoholic patient, 427 patient, Nafrud NASH patient uh, show better PFS and beta survival. Be, oh, oh, although this is a retrospective study, but uh, the reason why uh, is maybe Nafrud Nash HCC arise from the non serotic liver very frequently. So the uh, targeted agent or a post, uh, post targeted therapy, post uh, subsequent therapy or post. Uh, post progression survival is wrong. So, more uh, non serotic liver is uh, more frequent as compared with viral or alcohol in, uh, alcoholic HCC. So, lambda is exactly better efficacy in NAFRUD NASH HCC than normal NAFRUD. So, possible role of TKIs in advanced HCC. Uh, ICI is suitable patient, of course, at as well as the first choice of treatment. But uh, this is a very, um, I'm not, the uh, autoimmune disease may be not the uh, ICI uh, unsuitable. But uh, beta cadenin mutated, mutated ACC, of course, this, this is questioned. The beta cadenin mutated ACC is not, uh, not effective uh, to the uh, ICI monotherapy. We do not know. Combination therapy may be uh, effective for uh, beta catenin mutated HCC. We need uh, more data. Also, pure NASH HCC is not effective to uh, ICI monotherapy, but at as of web, we don't know. Uh, we need more data. But uh, very importantly, these beta catenin mutated HCC and pure NASH HCC may not be effective for at as of web. Uh, therapy, so the we we have to be careful. Uh, we keep in mind beta catenin mutated ACC or pure NASH ACC might be not effective. So six week uh, after two cycles, uh, 
uh, CT imaging is very important. If early PD is observed in this patient, we have to switch uh, as quickly as possible. So th this is uh, my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Professor Kudo, for very insightful lecture. So may I introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Bruno Sanko. So uh, uh, Bruno is one of the well leader in the immunotherapy of liver cancer. He is currently director of the liver unit and co-director of the HBP Oncology at Hinka University, the um, Lafara in um, Penana, Spain. He's also a professor of med internal medicine and lead an active research program in the Spanish network for biomedical research, especially on hepatic and digestive disease. His main research actually focuses on the therapeutic innovation in the field of liver cancer. Um, Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so so the next speaker is Professor Sango Bruno. So uh, uh, Sango is one of the well leader in the immunotherapy of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. He is currently the director of the liver unit and co-director of the HPP oncology um, area at the Kinker University, the Lafara in. Pamplona, Spain. He's also a um, professor of internal medicine and lead an active research group at the Spanish level for biomedical research, especially in the area of hepatic and digestive disease. His main research actually focuses on the therapeutic innovation in the field of liver cancer. Um, he's currently the president of the International Liver Cancer Association. So, Bruno, please. Thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you very much to the uh, organizing committee of this APASO webinar. It's really a pleasure to join uh, distinguished faculty and particularly excellent friends in, in sharing our thoughts. Um, I've been asked to talk about the future, and that's an easy job because uh, the future is by definition unpredictable. So whatever I say would be right, even if it's... Uh, uh, ultimately happens or not. So, and, and many of the, of the things uh, that uh, I, I could say about the future have already been discussed in some detail. So basically uh, today I will talk more about um, opinions, uh, perspectives and philosophy rather than presenting data, because as you can imagine, there are no data for what would happen in the future. These are my disclosures in different directions. So first, let me uh, remember, it's already been said, but today, when we talk about systemic therapies, we are talking about the treatment of a small subset of patients that even either are diagnosed or ultimately reach a situation where they have metastases or vascular invasion or have a very heavy uh, tumor burden inside the liver. And, and this is indeed a, a small fraction of the patients uh, due to screening activities. Many patients are diagnosed in early stages and due to the uh, um, good uh, performance of many local regional therapies, uh, patients may not reach the advanced stage where systemic therapies are needed. It's already been said different societies uh, are providing different guidelines. And uh, um, um, this is the ILCA uh, guidance document, not really too different from what we've, you've seen before, Atisobev as the first choice, uh, TK inhibitors as alternatives. But I, I was bringing this to highlight the fact that uh, I, I still think, I'm, I'm sure there is today, room for uh, 
uh, monotherapy of immune checkpoint inhibitors in the treatment, systemic treatment of HEC patients. And I do believe this is going to be the same in the future. And this is because, um, particularly in Western countries where uh, patients are uh, with HEC are usually elderly and very frequently they have comorbidities linked to the metabolic syndrome. Uh, these patients um, uh, have uh, relative or even absolute contraindications to both antiangiogenics uh, like bevacizumab, but also um, other antiangiogenics like TKIs based on the cardiovascular effects. So in these patients, based on the data we have from uh, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, uh, are still very well treated with single agent uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, immune PD-1 inhibitors. And I don't think this will disappear in the future. Uh, on the contrary, we are seeing a burst of metabolic syndrome in mainline China and other Asian countries. So I think this uh, option of uh, single agent uh, um, immune checkpoint inhibitors is going to be there in the future. But of course, the future of systemic therapy are combinations therapy because, because this is what is being tested in phase three clinical trials. Nothing to add to what has been said for the combination of atisilizumab and bevacizumab. Please remind us, it's illustrated in the slide, that uh, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors are at the core, are the backbone of all combinations that are being tested. And, 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 and so uh, and, uh, it's, it's unlikely that what we will see in the future is not a combination with a PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitor. This is important in terms of toxicity as I will discuss later. So Atisobev already explained. And uh, I have to say that the data from Atisobev have been nicely replicated by the Orion 32 trial. Uh, combining centilimab plus uh, bevacizumab biosimilar in a, in, a, in a Chinese population of hepatitis B patients. So speaking for uh, a class effect here, uh, similar to what we have observed for single agent uh, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. Then we have combinations of uh, these inhibitors with CTLA-4 inhibitors. CTLA, as HEC is a CTLA-4 sensitive uh, tumor. And of course the combinations with the already active multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, um, just a few data to, to, to highlight some factors. These are the data from the uh, ipilimumab plus nivolumab combination that uh, uh, Thomas uh, already reported. That was, and the, uh, what I would like to bring is the attention to the updated uh, overall survival with a more prolonged uh, uh, follow-up. And, and you can see here that the combination that has been uh, uh, that has shown the better results and it's already approved in the United States has an un absolutely unprecedented uh, uh, long-term survivors uh, rate uh, at uh, around four years of more than 30 percent post serafinib and this really speaks for one point I would like to highlight and is the fact that in any uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, vision of the future, we have to uh, pay attention to the long-term survival rates, not only median survival on overall survival, but also uh, um, long-term survival rates on the one hand. And second, that uh, it, when we are talking about very prolonged survivals, toxicity is a must and, and toxicity will drive decisions and will drive uh, regulatory decisions as well. Data from uh, the combination of another check, uh, CTLA-4 inhibitor, tremolimumab, with the PDL1 inhibitor, duvalumab. A very complex trial, randomizing patients to four different options, just to make sure that uh, um, the, the combination that resulted in the highest response rate and the more pr uh, prolonged follow-up was that including a single uh, um, a priming dose of tremolimumab plus duvalumab. What is the interesting here? Uh, again, looking at the potential for good tolerability in the long run, that maybe CTLA-4 uh, could be given only for a short period of time, even a single dose, uh, without compromising the efficacy and, and, and yeah. certainly hoping the tolerability. 
We also have data, phase two data from the combination of uh, Pembro and Lenvatinib, uh, and also here unprecedented 36% response rate. Uh, with most patients beyond the, these 36 response, most patients exhib exhibiting some degree of uh, tumor shrinkage uh, uh, and the um, our target lesions. But again, highlighting the fact, as you can see on the right, that severe grade three treatment related adverse events appeared in the majority of the patients. And that included not only lab uh, of, uh, value toxicities, but also symptomatic uh, toxicities. Um, all of these combinations that I've mentioned uh, in phase three trials, and we will have to wait for the coming months, uh, hopefully not years, for these trials to report and uh, see if one or more of them uh, are also positive. And so we will have these uh, combinations available. If that is the case, if the combinations are available, then toxicities will be a must. We know from the Checkmate 459 trial that uh, when you compare single agent nivolumab with single agent serafinib, uh, the tolerability is much better for the checkpoint inhibitor. You see, if you pay attention to the uh, all grade uh, uh, adverse events rate, but more importantly to the grade three or higher adverse events rate, uh, the, the frequency is certainly um, a lower and this translates into better quality of life, significantly better quality of life. If uh, we are going to see what happens with the combinations, certainly nobody would expect that the uh, uh, combinations with TKIs would result in better tolerability. Uh, rather the opposite we will, because we will have the combined toxicities from both uh, uh, treatment uh, um, uh, class agent. When we come to the combinations with atisobev, also you may see how the frequency of all grades and grade three adverse events uh, was uh, lower in the uh, combination arm. And uh, we will have to see if uh, this is replicated for the combinations of uh, dual uh, uh, immune checkpoint uh, uh, blockade with CTLA-4 and pd one one pdl one uh, From phase two trials, we may see that this is, may not be exactly the same, and so toxicity uh, would be an issue here. This would be an issue even more when we come to what future could bring in uh, also, which is activity in earlier stages. A number of trials testing uh, basically uh, single agent uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors as after a successful resection or percutaneous ablation, but also some uh, uh, combinations, including uh, atisobev. Uh, and more importantly, when we all these uh, um, single agent or particularly combinations are being tested in the intermediate stage. And here you, we can see, has already been mentioned, that uh, what is being explored is uh, a, a combination of taste plus uh, immunotherapy or combinations of immunotherapy with uh, other agents, head to head compare with, uh, uh, or compared with taste, or even the head to head comparison of uh, um, in, uh, systemic therapy with taste in, in recently uh, developed uh, trials. And here we have to recognize that we already have the experience from TKI inhibitor monotherapy with sorafenib uh, uh, um, uh, and, and brevenib having uh, no significant effect in combination with taste in the intermediate stage and for sorafenib having no effect as an adjuvant therapy post resection or ablation. And, and, and so uh, first we have not to take for granted that the immunotherapy would work where the TKI inhibitors have not worked, but more importantly, we will have to pay attention to the possibility that the combinations may work better. Of course, what would be needed anytime, uh, and this has already been discussed, but even more when we come to scenarios like the early stages and intermediate stage, where uh, the benefit may not be that universal and toxicity may be a harder issue, the possibility of identifying the patients upfront. For serapinib in phase two, we, we had the opportunity to see that there was a, a, um, a tumor tissue a biomarker phosphor staining 
that in the phase uh, two was able to identify uh, uh, patients uh, with and without uh, uh, or with different times uh, to progression. And this could have been an excellent uh, biomarker if positive. The problem is that it was not tested in any uh, sorafenib trial. And in fact, not all the other, not any of the other TKI uh, um, trials uh, had a comprehensive biomarker study that could, could allow us to identify patients that would benefit upfront. This is absolutely the same for atisabev, where we don't have yet uh, data from the biomarker uh, uh, analysis, but uh, where man, uh, tumor biopsies were not mandatory, and probably the biomarker analysis would not be uh, uh, strong enough to derive strong conclusions. And this takes us to an important point for the future developments, that is, what are we seeing with atisobev combination? Are we seeing just an additive effect or are we seeing a synergistic effect? On the one hand, we know that there is certainly at least an additive effect because when, when uh, in the phase two trial, atisobev was compared with atiso, uh, PFS was significantly better with the combination. But we have to remember that bevacizumab that was not further developed as a monotherapy because of toxicity issues, had already produced a significant number of objective tumor remissions in hepatocellular carcinoma. So we, we should not take for granted that what we are seeing is a synergistic effect. Of course, there is a rationale for that. We know that VEGF, the target of bevacizumab, is important in recruiting, expanding, and enhancing the action of three different population of immunosuppressive T cells that are present in the tumor microenvironment, regulatory T cells, tumor macrophages, and myelo-derived stromal cells. And uh, in, as well, uh, VEGF is important in, in reducing the activity and the uh, uh, expansion and therefore the quantity of uh, dendritic cells, which are important for the elicitation of immune response. So yes, certainly a, a, a room for uh, looking for a synergistic activity, but yet a synergistic activity that may not, has not been proven in humans, and therefore we should not take it for granted. And this uh, would be very important for designing new combinations and uh, expanding the role for patient selection of these combinations in earlier stages. What do we know from uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors? We know that at least for uh, um, um, checkpoint uh, PD-1 inhibitors, uh, the, the uh, uh, PD-L1 expression is not able to identify significantly uh, the good responses. You may be a good responder even having a low expression of PD-L1. This is in tumor cells. For Pembro, it has been analyzed in, in, in uh, uh, stromal cells as well. High, uh, higher differences between responders and non-responders, but nevertheless, not a good, uh, not a good uh, level for identification of patients. And the data we have for, from CheckVid 459, again, not a good candidate. And there are other uh, potential candidates, gene signatures, uh, identifying um, um, tumor with a high interferon gamma activation in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, but these are, uh, certainly not uh, um, ready for uh, clinical use. And when it comes to tumor uh, uh, mutational burden, the few data that we have today is that it might not yet, it might not uh, certainly be uh, um, a, 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 a definitor of uh, enhanced response. So finally, as we move to the future, certainly beyond expanding the activity of what we have now, which are uh, combinations with PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, we have to think outside the box. What else can we do? What can we do that for those uh, uh, tumors where antigenicity is absent or is poor? One possibility is therapeutic vaccines. Uh, this has been extensively tested in the past with dendritic cell or peptide platforms. All of them failed. I'm not going to go into the details of why this is so. All of them failed and probably they have failed because all, most of these uh, um, vaccine uh, therapies have uh, targeted what we call tumor-associated antigens, alpha-beta protein, glipican-3, uh, proteins that are uh, not expressed in, in adulthood, only in the embryonic stage, 
and it probably not recognize herself uh, because of this, uh, but uh, there are different um, sets of data highlighting the fact that uh, probably these are weakly immunogenic and what matters are tumor specific antigens derived from a, uh, specific mutations of occurring in specific tumors. This has been the purpose of uh, uh, um, strategies as, such as the HEPAVAC, a project we run in the uh, uh, European Union. Uh, uh, patients analyze for the peptidome and, and the mutinome, then uh, the HLA-restricted best uh, tumor-associated peptides being identified. Those that were shared between different patients uh, uh, are formulated into a single formulate, uh, formulation and injected in combination with a potent RNA adjuvant to patients. Now, the data will be released soon, but we can anticipate now that the uh, uh, biological efficacy was there, but the signs of clinical efficacy were uh, weak to say the most. Uh, probably what we need to do in this regard is to uh, go to uh, individual prediction of uh, relevant uh, new antigens and uh, just to share with you some of the data that we're doing in this regard. We have analyzed patients for uh, mid-sense uh, um, mutational variants uh, and, and those predicted to potentially bind HLA class and T molecules uh, being identified. And, and when you test these uh, uh, peptides that have been identified in this way, 25% uh, 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 of the patients, uh, in 25% in, in of the patients, we could identify such kind of peptides. You can see in the right-hand side, you in, uh, it, it stimulate patients from healthy donor, human patients, human individuals with these uh, peptides. And you can see in green uh, that for both peptides, you can obtain uh, a, a stimulation of, of human cells, seeing that uh, these peptides are indeed immunogenic for humans. And probably these kind of platforms searching for personalized vaccines are the way to go in terms of uh, human vaccination. And just a few words about uh, adopted T cell therapy. You can, uh, this is being studied from uh, long ago, but now with the possibility to uh, uh, um, um, uh, isolate T cells from peripheral blood, engineer them in form of uh, modifying the TCR or expressing chimeric uh, uh, um, antigen receptors, what we call CAR T cells. Uh, this has come to the clinic. Uh, we have data coming from TCR engineered cells from uh, this uh, um, trial in which uh, uh, AFP recognizing T cells were uh, um, uh, I, um, engineered and then infused to patients in a uh, increasing doses and this is, was presented last year. Uh, good tolerability, mainly uh, cytopenia coming from uh, uh, lymphodepletion as a side effect. And as a proof of concept, one patient achieving a complete response that lasted for a long time. Of course, this has to be expanded. We have to learn more, but one may, patients may make a proof of concept. Similar uh, situation for uh, CAR T cells in these uh, two consequent uh, clinical trials uh, coming from China. Uh, uh, you can see in, this, in the bottom how uh, the clinical trial was a fixed high dose of cells um, uh, resulted in, in one uh, partial response. Again, a proof of concept that this may work. But here, uh, as for you would expect for CAR T cells, higher rate of uh, uh, um, cytokine release syndrome requiring high dose steroids and even interleukin-6 uh, receptor inhibitors. Uh, another way to go finally would be uh, not to uh, engineer the cells, but uh, take advantage of the uh, T cells that uh, are in the tumor that could recognize specifically tumor cells and expand those. And to do so, you can, you can uh, uh, identify the neoantigens and uh, use that neoantigens identification to expand the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes uh, that can be then reinfused. And we've been working on this. And uh, I think these kind of platforms uh, uh, um, will be soon ready for clinical application in clinical trials and probably uh, provide a better tolerated, eventually more active uh, treatment. So to finalize my take home messages will be that targeted agents 
including chain point inhibitors, certainly prolong the survival of patients with advanced CCC, despite a lack of comprehensive understanding of the biological mechanism of these effects. Alone or in combination with VH inhibitors or the checkpoint inhibitors or multi tyrosine cannabis inhibitors, they are being tested across tumor stages. And here, safety uh, and patient reported absence will be key elements of individual treatment decisions. Of course, new strategies, such as the one I have highlighted, should be developed to treat poorly antigenic tumors. And certainly, we need multi platform research involving human samples. Human samples are essential to advance in, in understanding of the tumor marker environment and the changes induced by therapy. And with this, I would like to thank you for your orientation and invite you all to the next ILCA conference in September that will be virtual. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for uh, Bruno for very insightful talk. So how much time we have <laughs> left for discussion? Anyone? The secretary, how much time should we end now or we still have some time for discussion because it's supposed to end now, but can we spare 10 minutes for discussion? Um, according to the original schedule, it's a time to the end, but um, uh, it's as you like, please, uh, Professor Lim, could you? Is Professor Dim here? I'm sorry. Um, yes, we may have uh, 10 minutes, about 10 minutes for discussion because uh, we have already several questions in the uh, Q&A box. Um, Professor Yao, would you check the... Okay, yes. yes. So I see a few questions in the here. Um, so maybe I start with the last uh, question first. I'll, I, um, this question may be a, a better answer by Kuto. May I, uh, one of the audience ask, may I know the use of targeted therapy and Im immunotherapy in patients with child B cirrhosis? So I know Kudo recently published the Chapmay cohort 5 in JH. So Kudo, you are the best person to answer this, I guess. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, for child patient, uh, checkpoint inhibitor, monotherapy is, uh, can be tolerable and the uh, um, efficacy is good, but the combination with uh, targeted agent, it's... Uh, uh, it, uh, we need to explore more because uh, targeted agent, I mean, TKI has uh, tolerability is not so good. So child B7, 8, maybe not. Of course, TKI itself, the patient cannot tolerate. So Okay. So one question uh, uh, following a uh, uh, follow-up question from me is that, so uh, a lot of you talk about etisobaf. So we will use etisobaf in patients with child put B7? To me? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, atezobaf can be used in child, child B7. Okay, but we have no data, right? No data. <laughs> yes, good. Okay, so another question I think you guys have answered. So uh, one of the audience asked, uh, Professor Kuto, should etiology be account for the choice of systemic therapy, like IO failure in, in the last uh, patient? I think Professor Kuto in the lecture has explained quite clearly. So do you have anything to add, Professor Kuto? Yeah, at the present, at, um, I see a monotherapy, maybe um, etiology uh, is, of course, uh, important. But uh, at the web, we don't have uh, data. And of, of course, uh, phase 1b, uh, pembrolemba, the PD rate is uh, around seven, only 7%. Seven that mm -hmm. means the pembrolemba combination overcome the uh, etiology mm -hmm. pro issue and the uh, catenary mutation issue, I think. Okay. So another question here is about TACE for management of unreceptive.
multiple HCC patient that would benefit from TAC e treatment, how we predict the profile of patient before TAC e treatment begin, which patient which patient are going to benefit and which patient are not going to benefit. I have already mentioned about the TC refractoriness or TC unsuitable, and uh, uh, there is no global consensus. Uh, but uh, Korean guideline recommend uh, TC refractoriness is uh, uh, within within six months, uh, two or more. TAC treatment does not achieve any uh, the complete remission, uh, at, at least partial remission. In that case, uh, we can say that lesion uh, is a TAC refractory. So in the, uh, in the case, uh, uh, we recommend another treatment. And so with my talk, uh, I suggest uh, uh, TC plus other treatment, other local treatment, and sometimes, uh, 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 sometimes the, the systemic treatment. Uh, I show my case, and uh, uh, I hope uh, th this is my answer. Okay. So another quite interesting question. I'm I'm not sure whether I understand the question completely. Uh, so one of the uh, audience asked is the combination of cancer peptide vaccine, so-called GPC three peptide, or the uh, uh, beta catenin targeting and molecular specific chemotherapy more effective in HCC. Well, I guess that's for me. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So first, um, uh, vaccination with uh, glipcan 3 peptides uh, formulations have not uh, yielded any relevant results. On the one hand, I don't think any, any vaccine would work in the absence of uh, 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 checkpoint immunotherapy, because even if you have um, 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 a, a, a recognition by the immune system, still the major problem of the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment will not be solved. So, and this applies for adoptive T cell therapy, applies for vaccination, for anything else. And, uh, and, and so combination is, is good, might be good, might be explored. I, I don't think this is ready for use. And regarding the beta catenin, uh, the, uh, Dr. Kudu presented this very nicely. There is a strong rationale for that based on, on animal models and, uh, and some uh, um, preliminary data for, uh, from, from the um, uh, cohort series. But uh, we don't have yet any data from, from immunotherapy trials. And as a matter of fact, I have to say uh, that the ongoing work we are doing in a phase two trial uh, in which we tested the combination of um, um, Y90 radioembolization plus nivolumab, uh, although this is a, still a work in progress, it does seem, seem like beta catenin uh, mutations are associated with a better response. So I think we will have to be careful in extrapolating animal models to human data. And uh, what we need is to wait and see. And uh, 459, uh, and, and another prospective trials that have collected tumors yes. will certainly be an, an, an answer to this question. Okay. So I think the last question um, we have, um, um, and also because of the time, is our direct to Professor Kudo. Do you think the post DAA treated resolve um, hep C serotic patient with metabolic syndrome can be classified into the, uh, the LASH category? Um, can this group of patients uh, use a single agent checkpoint inhibitor? Um, it is very difficult and, and it, it is uh, dangerous at the present. The clinical diagnosis of a NASH or a NAFROD related ACC, it, uh, the, the T cell activation is completely different in NAFROD and the other type of uh, etiology. So, but uh, um, HPV eradicated 
patient with metabolic syndrome, I, we don't know uh, that it is yeah, the exact yes. Related or, so yeah. I, in my personal opinion, we should uh, treat by uh, combination therapy first. Then, uh, then if the two cycle of uh, combination therapy uh, atezovir do not respond, then switch to the um, targeted therapy. If Professor Yao, yes, um, Professor Kang is waiting for to wrap up his case presentation. Oh, okay, yes, Professor Kang, please. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yes. Uh, since we uh, we have only a couple of minutes, I'll just be really quick about it. So, well, so this was a patient uh, who was diagnosed as intermediate stage, and he was treated with multiple rounds of TACE within eight months. Uh, however, uh, the tumor progressed to uh, advanced stage with lymph node metastases. And because he was considered taste refractory or failure and also advanced stage, he was treated with nabatinib as the first-line systemic therapy because we did not have any uh, IO drugs at that time. And he remained uh, stable disease up to cycle four and also another uh, cycle. However, several weeks later, the patient admitted to ER presenting with fatigue, anorexia, and abdominal pain. And the CT scan showed that uh, there were uh, peribiliary metastases and obstruction and also newly developed ascites. Uh, denoting that he has decompensated liver cirrhosis. And his laboratory tests show that his liver function has uh, worsened from child to A5 to B7. And also he has cholestatic pattern of liver dysfunction. And also his tumor, tumor markers have also increased. So he had ERCP for biliary decompression. And just to summarize, uh, so this was a, a patient who presented with intermediate stage, but he had uh, taste refractoriness and the tumor progressed to advanced stage with lymph node metastases. Uh, so he was treated with uh, first line TKI until the disease progression was uh, found. And however, further systemic therapy was limited by deterioration of liver function and also performance status. And I think this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Professor Khan. So any comment from the panels? I think this is uh, an excellent job for the, all the speakers and uh, congratulations to all the very good works. And I think it's almost time for us to close the sessions. Am I correct, Chairman? Uh, yes, uh, Josh. <laughs> So any further uh, questions? If no, thank you very much for participating in this webinar. Um, we will see each other again soon. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you.